Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Crackers and Grape Juice. I'm Tier Hardy, and on today's episode, we have a conversation that Morgan and I had with Mike Morrell at the Open Faith Conference at Christian Theological Seminary last month. Uh, this conference was hosted and organized by the Open Network, um, specifically by Doug Paget, and it was the first gathering of the network. It was an awesome time. It was Morgan and I, uh, who are obviously United Methodists, infiltrating, um, mostly me, infiltrating a evangelical space. Morgan has a little bit more evangelical background than I do. But anyways, this conversation from that conference is with author, uh, self-described wannabe mystic and prophet. He is a publishing consultant, freelance journalist, the one of the founding organizers of the Wild Goose Festival, Mike Morell. Mike's latest book uh, is titled The Divine Dance, The Trinity, and Your Transformation. He wrote this alongside uh, the one and only Richard Rohr. It is an awesome, awesome book. And we, Morgan and I, had the opportunity to talk with Mike about uh, the Trinity, the Divine Dance, and how that can transform your life. Uh, while this was one evening at the conference after uh, a day full of conversation about progressive Christianity and all those good things. You can head over to Mike's website, mikemorell.org, and you can find a bonus chapter uh, of the book, which is uh, even better because who doesn't love free things to read, especially free things that are worth reading. So buy the book on Amazon and then head over to the website and get the free download. Speaking of websites, Crackers and Grape Juice has a newly launched website within the last month, crackersandgrapejuice.com. You should head over there as well. Take a look around, find out a little bit more about Jason Taylor, Morgan and I, and the Meet the Team section. You can also subscribe to the podcast over a variety of platforms and links are located at the top menu bar for that. Uh, on the website also are links for all of our social media pages, so you can really go there as a one-stop shop for everything you've ever wanted to know about the podcast. As always, I'm going to invite you to head to iTunes specifically, though, and leave us a four- or five-star review. Those reviews are now uh, pulled into our website, so if you leave us a nice review, you can put your name on it and people will see just how nice of a person you are and who doesn't want a little public acknowledgement for all the nice things we're doing in the world. So you can do that. It's super easy to do. It takes you less than two minutes, and if my mom can figure out how to do it, I'm sure you can too. For now, that's enough of me talking. Sit back now, relax, and enjoy the conversation that Morgan and I had with Mike Morell. We are here with Mike Morell, and um, and Mike, gosh, I, I just always want to use the word guru to describe Mike, a guru of so oh many my. different things, um, just in terms of spirituality and networking and um, publishing, and, and basically, um, yeah, Mike has just had his... Fingers in a lot of different things. I don't know if that's that's a weird image, I guess. Um, but, but but I watched them afterwards. It's okay. <laughs> I'm glad this isn't on video. And it's still right, 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 right. <laughs> but um, but one of the most recent things that's really awesome. Um, Mike co-wrote a book with Richard Rohr um, called "The Divine Dance: um, The Trinity and Your Transformation," and I've been reading it, and it's amazing. Um, and so we just want to talk about the Trinity and because um, I think it's it's just really important within um, American Christianity for us to recover an understanding of the Trinity because um, a lot of times we just kind of live with a monarchical understanding of God, um, very monotheistic and not so Trinitarian. Um, so... Well, hang on, Morgan. Can you, because we don't use stained glass language, can you unpack that? Unpack that. For people who may not understand all those words with lots of syllables in them. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of times, just in our language, when we use the word God, the assumption is that we're not talking about Jesus or the Holy Spirit. 
Mm-hmm. The word God is a synonym for the first member of the Trinity, the, the Father, the, the source, or whatever word we want to use. And the idea, I mean, basically, within our language, we don't recognize the triune nature of God. So how did this journey begin um, in terms of this, this book um, and I guess well, okay. Let's start. Let's start a little bit before that. Um, maybe you could tell us some of where you come from in terms of your theological background and stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. Well, so you know, I'm a mid thirty something guy that's lived in the southeast my entire life. So I, I grew up in the Bible Belt and came to a you know a conscious faith experience, a born again experience at the ripe old age of four years old in a in a Southern Baptist context. And my, my parents had a, had a similar kind of conversion time during that same probably year, like 83, 84, something like that, in the Southern Baptist context. And we were there for a few years. And then they had another powerful experience in a Pentecostal context and, and brought mm. me there with them. And I, I similarly had what in that context would be known as like a baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, you know, I got involved in a Presbyterian church, a PCA Presbyterian church Mm -hmm. uh, that had a heavy emphasis in the arts and creativity and Mm -hmm. theology and learning that instilled in me this love for learning. So by the time I was, you know, a a late teenager, I was thoroughly a denominational mutt. Mm. Uh, You know, I'd, I'd been in all these different contexts and you could even say that those three denominations within a conservative evangelical context, at least, correspond to like you know um, hands, heart, and head. That mm. you know, Southern Baptists were the doers. There were the, these big right. missionary pushes, door to door evangelism, etc. Mm-hmm. Pentecostals, of course, the feelers. Like, what does it mean to enter into the presence of God? And what does it mean to live a life? You know, having the power of God flow through. And in the Presbyterian context, it was the thinkers. Like, I had never before experienced theology uh, being, even the term being used in a positive way. It was more of a derogatory term in my Pentecostal context. I don't get all that theology. And so it was like a love of learning and and the life Mm. of the mind. And at the same time, it wasn't all rosy uh, because each of those denominations felt like they had the corner market on on reality and the truth and like what, Mm. you know, God was up to on the world. And aren't we, you know, privileged to be God's special children? And so I had to become a practical pluralist, I think, from an early age when I realized that the exclusivity claims each of these movements made couldn't all be true. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't willing to even say that one of them was true and the other two weren't. And so I rather, and and I was not, nor was I willing to reject them and say that any one of them were false. So it was more a question of asking what is true about each of these? What is the gift that they have to offer? What is the beautiful thing they have to bring to the table? And I, am I able to appreciate that while um, leaving their the, the, the sort of exclusivity stuff, uh, the, many of the more prideful things, at the door? So very early on, I began to compost my faith, to let those things mm. decay, let new life flow out of that. Shortly thereafter, got involved in a house church context that was very post-denominational, uh, very egalitarian, uh, inspired in some ways by early Quakers and Anabaptists in the style of gathering, open, participatory worship. And within a few years of being in that context, I uh, got high-speed internet for the first time as a freshman in college in the late 90s and discovered the internet. And that led me to what later became known as like the emergent conversation and, and progressive mm-hmm. Christianity. So. That, that stew sort of, you know, f- formed the, the foment of, of my spiritual journey. Also, you know, around the same time as the Internet, a couple of years later, 9-11 happens mm. and sort of slaughters the sacred cow of nationalism for me as something that's like a goal of American Christianity. Before that, I wasn't aware that that was the water I was swimming in mm. and unconsciously assenting to. So, so I would say that whole period was like a period of, of deconstruction. Mm -hmm. Of what, you know, what isn't working. And then it led me to a question of what, what is working? What is the gift, you know, by then in my 20s is worth preserving? And that's when I discovered uh, contemplative Christian spirituality uh, through voices like, like Richard Rohr, Father Thomas Keating, Cynthia Bourgeau, and others. Like what, what gifts did they have to offer? And it was actually uh, my friend Spencer Burke, uh, founder of Mm. the once 
a great website, theooze.com, right. and Solarize Learning Parties. Started working with him in the early 2000s, and, and, and Spencer brought Richard Rohr into the com- conversation with evangelicals who were questioning things, and maybe even mainliners to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, Spencer's a huge Thomas Merton enthusiast, and, and like really had his finger on the pulse of contemplative spirituality. So I began to get to know Richard through um, my work with Spencer. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask you, you know, how how did you get connected with Richard Rohr? Mm-hmm. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. So Richard first came out to Solarize in 2001, which is the year before I got involved with Solarize. I started getting involved in 2002, and then we had Richard out again in 2007 when we had Solarize in the really, you know, um, roughing it location in the Bahamas. Where, where people had sacrificed <laughs> to do the Lord's work, uh, and it was an amazing uh, weekend. We had we had Richard, we had Brennan Manning, uh, N.T. Wright, and his oh wife Rita Brock, who's just this amazing church historian, uh, and just a number of, of people. My good friend Gareth Higgins was there. Uh, Frank Viola from my house church world was there. It was this kind of interesting melting pot, but only a hundred people showed up. <laughs> Sadly, because it was right when the passport requirements were changing for travel to the Bahamas. And I think a lot of people weren't able to, to make it. But but what happened there was just this really cool melting pot. And, and Richard taught us the Enneagram and even typed a number of us uh, while mm. we were there together. And that was, that was when I first got to meet him in person. And then also helping start the Wild Goose Festival. Mm. Uh, Richard was a big part of our first several Wild Goose Festivals before... He uh, semi-retired from traveling elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've talked about um, contemplative spirituality. And Mm -hmm. I definitely feel like there's a sense in which how we talk about the Trinity is different when our point of entry is through contemplative spirituality. And Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm interested in... Absolutely. What what your perspective is on that? I guess yeah, because if you're if you're not approaching um, the mystery of, of Trinity at, as one a mystery as something to be entered into with like a sense of awe, astonishment, reverence, it basically becomes this weird math problem. Mm. Right. How, how can three be one? Is this algebra? Is it geometry? What's happening here? <laughs> uh, and and that's just a non-starter. Not only for the, the culture at large, but even Christians. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Karl Rahner, a Vatican II era theologian, said that if the doctrine of the Trinity were to suddenly disappear from the lexicon of Christianity tomorrow, we would notice almost no difference on the level of our practice. Mm-hmm. And, and what Richard and I are saying in the Divine Dance is that that's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy that began to be uncovered in popular culture. I think nearly a decade ago, um, another project that I, I played a little role in was the launch of the novel The Shack. And when Paul Young wrote The Shack, um, it was a very vivid illustration of the idea of the relationality of God, that God is relationship, that God is this loving, mutual community that defers to one another, and that the oneness is found not in a mathematical oneness, but a relational oneness, mm-hmm. that they were, they were all unique persons, and yet they were all uh, united in what they were doing in people's lives and in the reality, conspiring for goodness. There was something about the contagious goodness of God in the face of unspeakable tragedy that has the shack now having sold like 28 million copies worldwide. And, and the film is coming out next spring from Lionsgate. Oh, yeah. um, and that, so I, the, the Trinity is the secret sauce that got people thinking uh, and, and feeling more in the shack. And, and its readership is way beyond Christianity. And, and similarly, to answer your question, Morgan, like a contemplative approach to the Trinity is saying, you know, what if we can enter into the mystery of relationship, whether we're, we're talking about communing with God or even if we're talking about communing with each other? Mm. Yeah, I don't. Are you? Have you read um, Sarah Coakley's work on the on the Trinity? Is I have that, not. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, she talks about the way that. Um, Gosh, it's, it's in Romans where Paul basically captures the movement of the Trinity by talking about how we pray, how the Spirit mm-hmm. sort of prays through us. Mm-hmm. And it's like we together are Christ, and the Spirit is basically praying through Christ as a way of, mm-hmm. you know, sort of connecting with the Father. Like that, that prayer itself is 
the life of the Trinity. Yeah, it's like this Trinitarian circuit that the, mm-hmm. the, the, the meaning of the phrase, you know, pray in Jesus' name, often becomes a sort of magic word that we use at the end of our prayers. Um, but that, like, in, in its context, you know, something that, that Richard teaches and that we have in the book is that praying in Jesus' name is like standing in, in the spot of, of Jesus, at, you know, through the power of the Spirit to the Father or whatever, you, you know, mm-hmm. however we name that, that source. And that that mutuality uh, forms a dance. And, mm-hmm. you know, if I love how you, you know, earlier y'all were talking about not using like really fancy multisyllabic words. So I'm about to use one and I'll, I'll break it down. And the word is perichoresis. Mm-hmm. We talk about perichoresis in the book. And it's actually um, originally borrowed from a theater term. What happened were, was there were these um, people known as the, the Cappadocian Fathers, and, and probably at least appropriately include a mother or two as well. They were these brilliant mystics and ascetics and theologians who lived in this area of Turkey called Cappadocia in the 4th century. And they were some of the first people to really articulate the idea of Trinity as such. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason is, is because we have these scriptures that refer, of course, to you know, a creator uh, as God, also refer to a spirit of God, a Holy Spirit, and also increasingly, as the text progresses, refer to Jesus as divine. And, you know, as good uh, Jewish people, how did they make sense of, of Jesus being divine? That was always an implicit thing that early Christianity wrestled with. And how the Cappadocians put it together is they borrowed a term from theater um, that is the same as our root word for choreography, parachoresis. Oh, wow. And it yeah. literally means circle dance. And they said, well, the three are one, just as dancers, you know, if you're dancing in a circle, there's this unity, this graciousness of movement that happens. And Mm. so when we talk about the divine dance, we talk about, you know, God, this three in one God dancing reality. And that it's not an exclusive dance, it's implicitly an inclusive dance that we're actually invited to the dance. So perichoresis is actually a very joyful and inviting word when we think about a partic- you know, participating in the life of God. Yeah, I read in a book recently, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy, um, but it was about, it was talking about just the creation story and the way that, the way that God talks about creation. He says, let there be. Uh-huh. You know, and, and I think the I think the term for that kind of construction is hortative or something like that. It's not okay. it's not a command. It's not saying you do this. It's saying let there be. So in other words, making space mm. for the agency mm-hmm. of a creature. Right. And that God's way of having power is that God's power empowers others' agency. Mm -hmm. Rather than God saying, you know, having power in the sense that um, I'm in control and you're not. Yes, absolutely. That's a major theme of the the Mm -hmm. book, The Divine Dance, is that, you know, the vulnerability of God is drastically underestimated in our Christian theology. And it's bizarre because... You know, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm. I think it was a Hebrews that says that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's being. So our hermeneutic ought to be Jesus. And how does Jesus show power? He shows power by turning the other cheek. He shows power by going the extra mile. And yes, he you know commands winds and waves. There are more, maybe we could say, conventional displays of power. But um, as, as Richard likes to say, if we pray to God, for every prayer we pray open to God as the Almighty, we also ought to open prayer to the all-vulnerable as mm. well. And there is this sense of givenness to God as revealed in, in Jesus and, and we think you know, revealed in Trinity that is very different than the Zeusian God of, right. uh, of Deus. That, you know, Deus, yeah. the root of that, is, is you know, the same as Zeus. And oftentimes our theological portrait of God is more like Norse mythology than it is like the God revealed mm-hmm. in Jesus. And the flip side is that, you know, this is something that is Richard and I were, as I was contributing to the book, um, you know, so much of, of my 
odd and fun phrasings made it in. This is one that got cut, and I totally understand why. But I said, you know, it's not a, a Zeusian god on the one hand, but it's not a Seussian god either. It's not a cat in the hat god uh, okay. of cheap sentimentality, right. which I think is the other god of American civil religion. Like yeah. on the one hand, the classic god of American civil religion is um, this sort of, you know, with all apologies, Calvinism uh, is this certain kind of austere, you know, lightning bolt. Uh, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And that is our classic civil religion. But our contemporary civil religion, let's face it, it's mostly not that. It's mostly this highly permissive self-help God of, of right. Joel Osteen. Right. So, you know, we're saying it's not a Zeusian God. It's not, I will say, it's not a Seussian God. Uh, but that there's a relational God that, you know, and in relationships there are boundaries. And in relationships there are, you know, th- those things are in place. But there's also love and regard and uh, is present. And we can learn a lot from from looking at classic theological ideas about the Trinity, entering into them contemplatively and experientially uh, in our lives, in, in community contexts, etc. This is making me think about back to the idea of being in relationship with one another, mm-hmm. um, us as as Christ's body, then also the Trinity being in relationship with one another and vulnerability, mm-hmm. and the idea that God is vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Um, just as much as God is Almighty, do you think that there's any correlation between our lack of understanding in the Trinity um, and God being vulnerable and all those things to our inability to be vulnerable with each other in the church today? Mm. That as masculine men in Christian America, mm-hmm. we are strong in our faith and we stand firm with our hymnals and our Bibles and our flags, and uh-huh. that's what we do. Yeah. And we don't let that guard down. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I mean, I even think that men in church, period, are an increasing rarity these days right. because, you know, for various reasons, you know, men. I think, you know, we have a hard time uh, living up to our own stereotypes. And then, of course, it's, it's even more hard, difficult to have those show up in a congregational context. But, but I think you're onto something. I think that we do become what we behold. And so if we have this, you know, image of, of God as, you know, as, as Zeus, then, uh, or, or even just, you know, we'll use the classical theological category of omnipotence. You know, I'm not going to pick on the term too much and go total process theology here, but I think if, you know, primarily if we think of God in terms of these like very aloof power over terms, then that has mm-hmm. to become a virtue in how we approach our own relationships. That being self-contained then becomes the, uh, the, the way to go. And, you know, and I think that there is a middle way or a different way between, uh, you know, uh, codependence and total mm-hmm. independence. And that is the, mm-hmm. the interdependency that says, yes, you are contained, and it's good to be able to go within and go on the inward journey, and we're here for each other. We're not in this alone, and that even the life of God is not in this alone, that it uh, that the, the, the three can create beautiful community. And there's a very poetic introduction in the book by, by Paul Young, the author of The Shack, where he, he, he unpacks that, why threeness is a basic building block for non-selfish community that even couples and you know he's married he's not against couples at all but that even couples there's a certain dualism or binary um, dynamic that begins to happen and that love in its fullest form can start to show up when the number three is in the equation could you say more about the law of three (laughs) Uh, because that's a term that's a phrase that's been getting thrown around a fair amount Absolutely. So the law of three, um, such a such a rich uh, image, and we have Cynthia Bourgeau to thank for bringing that into the contemplative Christian conversation, because the law of three is actually a um, a term that the um, the mystical teacher, early twentieth century, uh, George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, G. I. Gurdjieff, brought to the table, and he was an esoteric teacher who drew equally from Eastern Orthodoxy as well as Sufism, and, and probably some from Buddhism before it was cool, and uh, with, the, with the law of universe creation. And she introduced it as a beautiful way to understand the richness of the Trinitarian mystery. So I'm going to read a brief section from the Divine Dance called How the Law of Three Changes Everything. And it's, it's particularly salient for this moment. Think about it. It's election season, and you feel passionate about your favorite political candidate. You represent first force in the law of three, 
you're in your candidate's uh, corner. Your coworker, or maybe your parent, backs the other candidate of the other political party with equal passion. They represent second force. Now, the way we live so much of our lives stops right there. Someone takes position A, and someone else opposes them in position B. They exist in rivalry and antagonism, world without end. This is precisely the behavior we'd expect in a binary system, a place of two-ness in opposition. At best, when we're finished yelling at each other, we might try to compromise and form some kind of a quote-unquote synthesis position of our dialectic. This is how the philosopher Hegel saw the world, one of dueling dualisms. But the law of three asks the question that we've been asking, what if we don't live in a binary universe, but instead a ternary universe? If threeness captures the essence of the cosmos more than twoness, it means that we can hold our first force or second force perspectives with earnestness, while fully awaiting some third force to arrive and surprise us all out of our neat little boxes. Note that this isn't some mere synthesis of you and your coworkers' opposition, but something genuinely novel arriving on the scene, a position C. It could be, in our example, a viable third-party candidate that captures imaginations. It could be an upset within one of your political parties. It might be something on the outside that's quote-unquote bad, like a storm or natural disaster, which brings your community together in an unprecedented way that transcends politics. It could be an entirely non-political solution that presents itself with such urgency and vitality that everyone forgets, even if only for a season, what they were arguing about. The exact form third force takes is beside the point, nor is it that first and second force suddenly find themselves invalidated in the face of some newer, shinier debut. Instead, it's that this third force redeems each position and gives everyone a valuable role to play in the creation of something genuinely new, a fourth possibility that becomes the new field of our collective arising. Everything belongs. This is what we can expect to not just believe as an idea, but experience in practice. If we embrace the life of Trinity at work in all creation, then we sit invited uh, at Rublev's lovely round table, referencing the, the famous icon of the Trinity done by Andrei Rublev. The magic of three breaks us out of our dualistic impasses and always invites a fourth world for us to enter into. Cool. So let's say... I'm a Christian listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. and I realize that I've been mostly just monotheistic in how I worship, uh -huh. how I interact with God. Uh -huh. What is a starting point for me in mm -hmm. having a more Trinitarian praxis? Uh -huh. um, yeah, yeah, it's a great question. First, I'm going to be a theology nerd and say technically we're not saying anything against monotheism. Right, uh, right. You know, you know yeah. monotheism believing in one God. You know, Trinitarians still confess one God, although we do nuance it a bit more than our monotheistic uh, brethren in, in Judaism and Islam who have more of a, a sort of monolithic monotheism, yeah. or as, as we, we speak of a, of a monotheism that is enriched by the idea of one God in three persons. Mm -hmm. that's, the, uh, that's the theological fine print. Yeah. But as to the essence of your question, um, the most practical way I think of is to honor your relationships as sacred, to give the people in your life the same quality of regard that you give yourself on your best day when you're loving yourself and cherishing yourself. And is there a way to practice the presence of people with the same devotion that, um, you know, a full on mystic will practice the presence of God. And we give some practical, um, examples of things to do along those lines in the back of the divine dance. You know, one of the unique challenges that we think that we're facing in this moment is how do we develop uniquely Trinitarian spiritual practices and how are those different than the spiritual practices that we've always had? And with all respect, the practices we've always had, they tend to be more of a solo sport. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's even interesting how contemplative life is traditionally seen as different than congregational life. Because in congregational mm -hmm. life, you're singing right. songs together, you're doing things together. In, in contemplative life, you're, you know, you're off-centering doing centering prayer alone or praying the rosary alone or different practices. Mm -hmm. You might do it with a group of other people, but it's still like, um, 
oh, what's that movie? Is it uh, High Fidelity or about a boy where it's, uh, you know, single parents alone together? <laughs> mm. <laughs> this idea of, of being alone in a crowd. But what we do is, is we actually unpack the idea of bringing that contemplative awareness to one another, to practicing the mm. presence of people in a few simple exercises that could even begin this, with something as basic as, uh, as uninterrupted, vulnerable eye gazing with another human being and mm. seeing them as an icon of, of the divine, of God shining mm. through. And what does it mean to like, you know, worship God uh, and, and, and enjoy one another in this contained mm-hmm. space? So, you know, not to be crass, but by divine dance, there are a few practices in the back. Yeah. <laughs> we did that, we did that eye gazing this morning to start off the, the conference. Um, mm. And it was the most awkward thing I've done in such a long time. Really? Uh, Tell me more. What was it like for you? Um, number one, I'm an introvert, so I like to keep to myself. I like don't mm-hmm. like to look at other people. I just, mm. which is hard in ministry mm-hmm. uh, by itself. But staring into the eyes of a stranger, yeah, and then reciting um, that they are divinely created, wonderfully made, all those great things that I would acknowledge about every person, mm-hmm. but saying them out loud while looking somebody that I don't know in mm-hmm. the eye. Uh, you, you could tell that about half the room was comfortable doing it, mm-hmm. but, but the other half of the room, and I caught myself doing this to where I would be looking at you, and I'm doing it right now while I'm talking to you, mm-hmm. where I'm making eye contact and I'm like looking away. Mm-hmm. And I'm making like I, I'm not holding that um, yeah. for more than a couple seconds. I'm curious, was it different when you were on the receiving end, when it was being said to you that you were divine? We were doing it at the same time. Oh, so, okay. Okay. And so maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah. But I think for me personally, on the receiving end of it, if it was like just me by myself receiving that blessing, mm-hmm. I would have a harder time with it because I'm the type of person that mm-hmm. I have a hard time just receiving the blessing from anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would rather be the blessing. I think a lot of people in ministry and in the church in general have that. Here's something That's to try. Uh, go go to wherever you're going tonight and look mm-hmm. in a mirror and actually do um, hold unbroken eye contact with yourself for like a full one to three minutes. Mm-hmm. Just sort of looking at yourself, letting yourself in, and then say those same affirmations to okay. yourself. I'd be really curious to yeah. see what your experience is with that. Um, and I think that when I leave eye gazing um, exercises, what I like to emphasize is that it's not merely, you know, especially I think for an introvert, it's not merely like, hey, I'm going to let you totally in and I'm going to like open mm-hmm. the floodgates to my soul. Look, you know, look at me. It's also a matter of um, containment, recognizing that you do still occupy your own space. You do have a certain sovereignty over your own being and you're allowing a person to look at you and you're also extending your presence into them and you're also looking into mm-hmm. them. So it's a dance of containment and and givenness. And, and, and we I think that's what's going on in the life of God too. There's this beautiful illustration of personhood that we also address in the book that personhood originally when that when that term uh, came about it's also a theater term uh, i might be butchering the pronunciation but you know person personare or personare and it's and it's looking at masks it's the idea of of masks worn in the theater that express mm-hmm. something but they're not the the end all be all but they're still being worn by someone and so that the idea is that there's an interdependent reality to personhood that's a dance between individual um, individuation and mutuality so it's not that you totally give yourself away and you're this doormat and like hey this is my soul yeah. come on in uh, but it is a this is my soul and i want you to experience that this here with me and i want to experience your soul mm-hmm. so it's not dissolving the subject object distinction but it is uh, inviting a kind of participation mm-hmm. to go on when I think that really, um, when you talk about just the, you know, what, what we just talked about, it, it really strikes me that this is a move towards recognizing the subjectivity of God and mm-hmm. what has happened, you know, particularly kind of in Enlightenment, Western culture, is to objectify God. Mm-hmm. Is to and we, and when we make God external yeah. to our existence, and um, you know that inevitably, regardless of you know, even if we understand that God isn't you know a white man with a long beard sitting in a cloud, right. we're still objectifying. We're still putting him out there, 
Right. You know, as opposed to, you know, recognizing, I mean, the Apostle Paul said, don't you know that you are a temple and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? Mm -hmm. You know, which is, I mean, if he said that in any American church today, people would call him a heretic. Right. It's kind of new agey or that he, you know, approvingly quoted a pagan poet saying, in God we live and move and have our being. Mm -hmm. So, like, where is God not? In some ways, that to me like totally redefines the imminence and transcendence debate because it's it's why I'm a panentheist because I believe that God is all in all and I don't want to put limits as to the outer reaches of God. I definitely right. believe and experience that God is so much more than me and larger than me and yet there's not an atom of me that is not you know co-inhered by God and dwelling in God. And that really came home to me as a young, like my, my initiation, I would say on the contemplative path was the first time I read John chapter 17. Mm. I was sitting um, alone at, at the Presbyterian church I was at as a teenager. And I, for whatever reason, I was reading the Bible in church. Imagine that. And, uh, you know, it's reading John 17 in this, in the New American Standard, which is sometimes like clunky language. But I feel like in that case, it was like more unabashedly, uh, mystical in ways that might get like smoothed out in certain other translations. And just the language of Jesus's prayer in John 17 mm. is this language of, you know, just as I am in you, Father, and you are in me, so let them be in us and us be in them. It would like, it sort of stretched language to its breaking point about the sort of mutual indwelling that, that Jesus was elevating his uh, apprentices, his disciples to the same quality of communion with, with, father energy that he experienced and said that you know when i'm leaving them i want them to still be here where we are present tense and that like you know john's Mm -hmm. whole the you know the gospel writer of john's whole definition of eternal life is not an afterlife it is actually something that is to know you know the most intimate i've heard Mm -hmm. you know greek word for know is is involved in there the same word that we get gnosis from and that that is the the intimacy with which um that we're called to. And it's like right there in scripture. And at the same time, it wasn't something that I had had emphasized even in my Pentecostal upbringing, where it was still like the spirit coming upon as though from the outside and not the rivers of living water from within, like, mm. like Jesus taught. And I think that is a, a big part of the, the Trinitarian revolution is, is a su- the subjectivity of God, not in the sense of diminishing God, but actually saying that all of reality is, is subject to God and God is the ultimate thou, the ultimate sub- you know, subject in, in the I thou encounter of, of reality. You also do things with authentic games. Sure, but, yeah. Um, so if you want to find out more about me, I, I blog at org, And in fact, I'm offering a bonus chapter to Divine Dance, which is recounts a very personal experience I had with God as Trinity during this really low moment in my life where, mm-hmm. you know, the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the scaffolding came off and suddenly I saw this whole new structure that arose out of that by seeing Trinity and seeing the relationships in my life in a whole new way. If you go to mikemorell.org forward slash bonus chapter, um, we talk, I, I talk about that in the book. I also include some bonus exercises to, to get to your question in a mode known as authentic relating games. Mm-hmm. And authentic relating games are part of this worldwide movement that says we can experience greater empathy and human connection when we um, do something as disarming as playing some games. That, that allow us to, to deconstruct our normal social modes of being. And it can be this powerful, transformative catalyst. Mm-hmm. And so it, it is a lot of fun to, uh, to facilitate those. And, you know, I've done it for the last couple of years at the Wild Goose Festival um, as practicing the presence of people. And it's some of those exercises that make it into the book and into the bonus chapter. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for your mm-hmm. time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, it's really fun to finally be on the show. Yeah. And there you have it. Another episode of Crackers and Grape Juice is in the books. Thanks for taking the time today to check out our podcast. You can head over to crackersandgrapejuice.com to find out how you can subscribe to the podcast, leave reviews, find out more about us, or even leave us a message on the speak pipe, which is on the middle right side of the screen. Just click on that. You can record a short message for us, some feedback or a question you want us to talk about on the podcast. We'd love to hear from you. But anyways, we really, really do appreciate you taking the time to listen to us today. And until next time, grace and peace.